Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast, where we challenge the stigma associated with mental illness through conversations about a variety of issues impacting mental health. Here we bring you news, views, and interviews that intrigue, educate, and celebrate recovery. Leading us on this journey are the hosts of the Mind Vine Podcast, Daryl Mathers and Chris Bovey. Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast. We have um, myself, Daryl Mathers, Chris Bovey is my co-host. Uh, we're here at 7, I keep calling it 777, seven, 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 seven Bay yeah, Street in Toronto. Good, yeah. uh, typically, Ontario Shores produces this uh, podcast from our hospital in Whitby, but today we're uh, on site in downtown Toronto for Bell Let's Talk Day. We have a bunch of special guests today, but uh, joining us right now is uh, Dylan Casey, an actor you might recognize from a, a series of recurring roles, but uh, I know your big break was uh, Nikita yep. uh, on the on CW, and um, you've worked on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and mm-hmm. um, uh, Designated Survivor, so uh, thank you for joining us. Thank and, you for uh, having me. Yeah. So just before we kind of... Uh, did the intro? We've been talking a lot about uh, your about your profession. You know, you're an actor. You're on if set. If you want to call it that, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe just start with like maybe what you're doing now, what you're working on, uh, anything uh, kind of interesting going on in your career. Uh, well, the most interesting thing, oddly enough, is that I decided to not go to law school. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw you. And you look. You you went down that road a little bit. A right? little bit, yeah. Little bit, yeah. I set foot. <laughs> uh, I did a I did a semester at Osgood and I, I deferred it because of my health issues, mm-hmm. and I was uh, I was all set to go back. Um, I think it was like two weeks ago I was supposed to start up, and I just realized it's not for me. Mm-hmm. Took to the last minute though and decided mm-hmm. to not do it. Um, but right now I'm uh, auditioning for lawyer aud- parts. Auditioning now? <laughs> for yeah, and I, and I go in and they say we don't believe you as a lawyer. Sorry. <laughs> Um, no, I, I am, uh, I'm doing a lot of work with my brothers who are both writers. Uh, we're, we're developing something for FX, hopefully. We'll see how that goes. Um, and um, other than that, just auditioning, looking for work and, you know, being a Canadian actor. <laughs> nice. It's funny because our, our, one of our guests actually next is a law student, so maybe you can... You can touch, touch base with them, talk him out of it. I'm trying to just rip it off like a Band-Aid. I'm going to avoid eye contact with them. It's interesting because your, your path, you, you studied economics and different things. Where, where, did, where did interest in acting come in? What, what was that first kind of, this is something I want to look into or, or, or pursue as a career? Um, I guess when I was, I, it would all trace back to grade eight <laughs> when uh, we did the, the play. We did a, a play version of uh, Aladdin. And I played the genie, and it's still the best performance I've ever, <laughs> have ever had. <laughs> but I just, I really enjoyed that. And I just, I, 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 I guess I caught a bit of an acting bug at that point and, uh, you know, did Guys and Dolls after that. And then in high school, I did some more plays. And it just never really struck me as a, as a career choice. It was just something fun that I like to do. But um, so, so I went to university. I went to McGill. And I remember sitting in, uh, in class, at, in like a calculus class, and thinking, I hate this. This is so boring. I don't want to do this. So I applied to the Tisch School of the Arts, which is NYU's theater school. And I flew down there a week after 9-11 to do an audition. Wow. Yeah. And I bombed it. It wasn't good because I had no idea how to act. But I kind of I, I put it on hold. And, and, you know, in the summers, I would go do auditions. And then when I did my master's degree, I was doing more auditions. And I, I landed... Um, the hockey show MVP on CBC, and that's when I decided to give it a serious go. Great. Yeah. Your success, uh, you know, and knowing your story, and we'll get into your health issues, um, but your career at that point, uh, you know, you started to get more and more, you know, opportunities after uh, CBC, and I think I, I read that it was when you saw yourself like on a billboard in, in Times Square in New York that you actually thought that you could make a career or had a future. In yeah, acting. that's all it took. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that was... MVP was an interesting experience because it was, it was just sort of like stutter step after stutter step. You know, I did the pilot while I was writing exams, you know, and then uh, it, I, I decided to kind of put everything on hold and, and shoot that show. But then it took a year for that show for them to, for CBC to decide to shoot the full season. Mm-hmm. And then even then it was only eight episodes and then nobody watched it. <laughs> <laughs> but then a, an American network liked it and they picked it up and they deci- America goes big with everything. Right. So they decided that they were going to do a billboard in Times Square and I'm in my underwear holding a hockey stick. <laughs> 
and I went down and saw that. And you know, before I, I wanted to, I was pretty committed before that point. But I guess at, after that, I thought, oh, I might be famous. But you know, I don't know. And, but you wanted to do comedy, right? Well, that always. was kind of always your because uh, I think you went to your. You spent a lot of time at Second City, going there with your mom, and and that was always like your first love, I guess, in terms of performing arts, wasn't it? Yeah, it definitely was. Uh, it was always, I mean, I, a, a big part of me wanted to try to get on uh, main stage at Second City in Toronto. When I went to LA, the first thing I did was try to join the Groundlings and uh, the UCB and do all that improv. I still want to try stand up, but I just don't have the guts to do it. Um, my brothers are both comedic writers, and my sister is the funniest person I know. I mean, we used to do this thing called uh, Comedy Hour, which is like our brothers, my, me and my brothers before we went to bed, my brother would sneak into our room, and we had a little closet, and you'd go in the closet and try to come up with something funny, and then come out, and whoever laughed had to go, go up and be the person that went up, right? So our whole thing was just trying to make each other laugh. That was our whole thing you know we'd fight but then it would just be about who could be the funniest mm -hmm. so that's kind of what got me into acting and performing and when I did you know I did Aladdin I was the genie it's just a goofy mm -hmm. role I just like that feeling I like I like making people laugh so I haven't I've done some comedy in my career but it's been mostly drama and I've, I've any comedy that I do has been usually with my brothers making our own stuff mm -hmm. you talk about that time in in your career as you're kind of getting more opportunity and like I guess it, it sounds like um, understanding yourself a little bit better as an actor and growing and then coming into kind of your, your the mental health struggles and eventually addiction like how, where did like success and I know you have a family history like where does all that kind of like intersect in terms of your you know your own personal story um, where does sorry I don't understand what I'm just uh, maybe the origins of your you know your connection uh, to mental health, because I know that at okay. the time you were in L.A., where things kind of uh, maybe uh, started down that road. Um, like, where where does your mental health story kind of um, well, I've always launch? Uh, yeah, it's definitely something that's in my family. On my dad's side, there's a lot of depression. On my mom's side, there's uh, depression and anxiety and and that sort of and some addiction. There's addiction on both sides. Um, I'm Irish, so <laughs> whatever that means. <laughs> um, and uh, I was always a very anxious kid growing up. My, my biggest problem was I would ruminate. Mm. And ruminating is just, a, it's a, I guess it's a sign of anxiety. And my anxiety would lead to depression. Um, so I, uh, you know, when I was in school my first year, I think in my first semester, I, uh, that was my, my real first hit with depression. I didn't know what it was. I just didn't feel like leaving my dorm room. I didn't see the point, you know. So I would isolate myself. Um, and... Eventually, I was able to, to break out of that and really enjoy and participate in the world. And I had a really good time in school. But then when I became an actor, acting is tough because you don't get up and go to work every day. I mean, you might, a lot of people might hate their jobs, but at least they get to go out and participate in the world and be social. Mm. Acting, not so much. You know, you, you don't, a lot of times you feel like you don't really have much of a purpose, you know, and you, you're getting rejected all the time and you don't know when it's going to end. And if you're an anxious person who's prone to depression, it's the worst thing. You know, you really need to, f to force yourself to be social, get out there, and find something to do when you're not working. And I was not able to find that because I was very, I was just so focused on being successful as an actor that I was too focused. And, you know, I kind of still am sometimes, but I, I'm aware of it. But I was just very myopic and very much like, that's what I have to do. Everything has to be directed at that. And it would prevent me from being... From, from doing the things that I needed to do to be happy. Um, so, uh, it's when I'm in my first acting job in MVP, I, um, I didn't really feel like I knew how to act, and I felt like I was screwing the whole show up, right? So, I would, you know, I would do a scene, and I would ruminate on a line that I said, you know? And I would think, it would hit me like a couple days later, or, the, or an hour later, or whatever, um, a better way to say that line. And I would say it over and over and over in my head. Oh, why didn't I say it like that? Why didn't I say it like that? Why didn't I say it like that? And I wouldn't be able to let it go. And that rumination kind of led me to privately, you know, almost having like nervous breakdown, right? So it took me years to be able to let go of that. Um, and when I was 27, uh, 
that's when I was I was hit with some very very bad anxiety just being very isolated in Los Angeles sorry I'm kind of jumping all over the place but being I was just so isolated in in Los Angeles and so depressed um, that I I I came home and I I, I saw my doctor and that's when they first started me on uh, on an antidepressant I think it was a Fexer and you know a month later I it I I found that it really helped me Um, but then unfortunately I found another drug after that yeah. I thought it was interesting, too, that it was easier to find, uh, you know, the drug was sort of opioids. Oxycontin was the first thing that you had taken. It was easier to find here than in L.A. Is that correct? Like, well, I was never looking for it. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. It was, not, it was not something that ever crossed my mind. You know, I was never much of a drug user. I never, I don't like weed. I, I would drink on the weekends. Um, sometimes I would smoke cigarettes if I was like, if I was anxious, but anything hard, mm-hmm. cocaine, Heroin, opioids, no, I never, never even crossed my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're right, yeah, it was, it was offered to me here. Mm-hmm. But it was, it was also, it, was, it wasn't offered by somebody who was getting it illegally. It was a right. prescription. It was a prescription mm-hmm. drug, right. Yeah. And then that first time you took it, what was the sort of the spiral? Like it, when you immediately took it, did you, did you think anything about you know, how it made you feel? Or, or when did it start to sort of take hold, the addiction side? Well, I was doing uh, Nikita, and again, I had this sort of golden handcuff, you know, that I was, I was on a show, but they weren't using me. Mm-hmm. So I'm sitting in Toronto. I can't go to auditions, really, because I'm on a, under contract. I can't try to do another job because I'm under contract. So I'm just, you know, idle hands, right? So I met with uh, this friend of mine who I wasn't really necessarily very close to. It was a bit of a social slash work thing. And um, he was taking these pills and uh, one way or another, I ended up taking one. And I just remember it just made me happy, you know? And I had all this time and uh, I I can't even remember how I got addicted to it, but I think I just had a lot of time and it was being offered to me and I really liked the feeling and it made me, it just, it took away all my depression, all my anxiety. It was the ultimate antidepressant, mm-hmm. you know? And before I knew it, I didn't even realize I was taking it so, so often, right? It was just, I'd go meet with this guy and we'd talk about work and he would slide two pills across the table mm. or I would say, hey, you know, can I have one? And then, you know, I'd go a day and I'd be so depressed that day and not know why. And I, then I'd think, Oh, maybe it's because I didn't, haven't taken those pills. Mm-hmm. But, you know, your rational brain's not really thinking at that point. So next time you see him, you're like, yeah, whatever, I'll take another one. It doesn't, there's no way I'm going to get addicted. You know, I don't take it that often. I, I was thinking, like, it takes months to get addicted to this mm-hmm. stuff. Um, and then uh, I, I, my run on Nikita ended, and I went back to Los Angeles, and I didn't have any pills with me. And I, I was, it wasn't until I was, like, in the middle of cold turkey opioid withdrawal that I realized I got myself addicted to it, mm-hmm. which is ridiculous, but I, I, I thought that I was just having a panic attack because right. I didn't have a job, and then it kept going, and I went, no, it's, holy sh, it's the opioids, right? I just remember referencing, you referenced like the Toronto Star article, <clears throat> and uh, you talked about it in, in that piece, because what you just mentioned, like you weren't using the rational part of your brain, but it seems like as you got further into your addiction and you're working... You were kind of aware of that you weren't your best self because um, uh, I think you talk about a couple of times where a camera guy, um, you blamed the camera guy for making you look. Uh, that was uh, that was near the end. Yeah, that was near the end. And then um, the, yeah, I'm sorry. And, and then another time when you actually got they writ you off of written you off of uh, Agents of Shield, and you're like, I understand why you did that. Those are both the same the same yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, that was um that was right at the very end uh, where that was like seven years into me being addicted mm. that was probably my rock mm. my rock bottom um you know at that point my my dad had already confronted me mm. you know and but i i knew i wasn't when i did the show remedy where i played an yeah. oxycontin addict yeah. Yeah. Gonna, right yeah, yeah that was when i what you won an award for did well i got nominated nominated for, an award. nominated for <laughs> yeah. a Canadian screen award yeah um so i uh when i was playing that character that's when I was probably at my worst, um, and I was desperately trying to hide it from everybody, and I, I thought nobody knew. Mm-hmm. 
I was blaming it all on, on Effexor, this antidepressant that I was taking. I was saying, oh, yeah, I changed my dose, so I might be acting a little weird. But, um, yeah, I mean, that was maybe after I'd been taking it for about a year, and I was completely hooked, and I knew it. And I, I, when you first get, realize that you're completely hooked to this stuff, it's the scariest feeling in the world because you're thinking, how the hell am I going to get out of this? Mm-hmm. But there's also a big part of your brain saying, do it tomorrow. Well, do it tomorrow. So... If you want to talk about Shield, I'm I'm open to. No, I, it was just the what struck me is just the how aware you were, I guess, at the end that you needed help, but you just couldn't. It sounded like you just couldn't bring yourself to at that point uh, to get the help or to to accept help. I, I guess. was because I didn't I didn't think of myself as a drug addict. Yeah. It's it's weird. It's um, there's this there's such a social stigma around addiction, and you know you're part of society, so. Yeah. If you're addicted, you're stigmatizing yourself. Mm-hmm. You're going, I'm such a... There's no way that's me. Mm-hmm. I also never touched a needle, so that rationalized to me. Yeah. Oh, it's not, it can't be that bad. I can just taper off this stuff, right? So I figured when I have the time and there's nobody around, I, I'll just taper off of it and that'll be that. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't do... There's no way in hell I could do that. Mm-hmm. So when I did Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., I was, uh, it wasn't my worst addiction time period or whatever you want to call it, but I was definitely still, still in it. And um, yeah, I was, I was stoned on set and I got confronted because I, I, you know, they did a take and my eyes were half closed and they, they asked me if I, was, if I was high and I lost my mind on this director. Just so, I got so defensive because I was so ashamed of myself and so terrified that people were going to know mm-hmm. that I figured, okay. I mean, I wasn't being rational. I didn't, it wasn't a rational response. Right. I just lost my mind on this guy, mm-hmm. thinking like, how dare you say I'm stoned in front of everybody? You, this, you know how embarrassing this is? People are going to think that I'm a drug addict? What the hell? Yeah, I, that, was, um, that was a horrible moment. But it was, it, the, the good thing was a couple weeks later, I poured everything down the drain and, and saw a doctor about it. Got. Do you feel like, and I'm curious around your, your support, I mean, not family, but the industry itself, were people coming forward or, or is it kind of like, as long as he's doing his job, we're not even going to talk about it. Like, do you feel like in a different environment, you would have had more people try to intervene from an industry than the, than a television industry? Do you think it took something really serious like that for that director to kind of they might have known along all along but never said anything to you before then or well when that article came out i heard from the showrunner from remedy who said he had no idea he said he had some suspicions but not of that um and a few people said that they had no idea they just thought that I mean, nobody had a reference point for me, right? So they didn't know what I was really like. Right. They just thought that was me. I'm a bit of a strange guy, and I'm moody. And the, which is right. probably not uncommon in show business. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it, when it comes to, to this idea that, you know, a lot of actors are susceptible to drug addiction, I wonder if that's true or if that's just because they're high-profile people, so we hear about it. Mm. You know, if a lawyer is addicted to OxyContin, it doesn't make the news, mm-hmm. Right. Right. So I, th- I think that there's a lot of people that are going through this addiction. We just don't know it, right? Um, as for, you know, whether the, anybody would confront me about it, I don't know if they would because I just don't, I don't think, it, unless you're very sure about something like that, then you're not mm-hmm. going to do it, right? It took a few years for my family to confront me, let mm-hmm. alone somebody I work with, right? Right. And you would, probably wouldn't be open to listening to Absolutely time, not. So. No, I would, I would have denied it, you know. Yeah, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been good. If, if somebody confronted me, it wouldn't have been a good interaction. Mm-hmm. So what, what made you take the steps in toward recovery, and, and what was that journey like? It was painful, for sure. Um, I, uh, after Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., <clears throat> excuse me, um, about a month later, I was walking down the streets of L.A. at like midnight with uh, a bottle of liquid morphine in my pocket. And uh, I was walking back home from 7-Eleven with some ice cream. I was eating ice cream every night. I don't know why. But um, this kind of everything flashed through my head suddenly of 
how my life had gone from the moment I started taking drugs to then. And it just got worse and worse. It was just, you know, I was, my relationships with my family were completely strained. Work was getting worse and worse. I was constantly lying to everybody I knew. I couldn't maintain relationships with people. You, you're not, you can't maintain relationships with people because you're lying to them all the time. You, you're, and you don't care really. All you're thinking to yourself is, do I have enough to get me through the next few days? Mm-hmm. So, and you're, you're lying to them about a huge part of your life. It's like a, 90% of your life is drugs at that point, right? And you can't tell them the truth. So you, you're not, you can't have a relationship. So everything was just getting worse and worse and worse. And I just, at that point, I, 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 it's something I should have seen years before, but I, I just knew that there was no way out. And if I kept down this train, like I, I, I couldn't fix it myself. So I poured everything down the drain and I, uh, I went home and I had some of this stuff called Kratom, which is an herb, herbal opioid, which I call herbal suboxone, um, which I was able to take to avoid withdrawal. And I called an addiction specialist the next day and he saw me and I told him everything and he just put me on suboxone. It was just, I, I don't, I felt so stupid because I thought, why, I'm not ready to tell everybody but why can't I tell a doctor? They can't tell anybody. Mm. It's, you know, there's confidentiality. Just tell him. He'll, what's he going to do? Kick me out? <laughs> you know? So he's yeah. just like, yeah, okay. Here, we'll put you on Suboxone. So I went on Suboxone. I started seeing a counselor. Um, and then, I, yeah, that's when I, I did that for a couple of years. But then I eventually went to rehab to get off the Suboxone. Right. Yeah. Can you just, sorry, Chris. You just talked about, like, keeping secrets and lying to people for so long. What was it like... Telling that doctor everything. It was... It was a huge relief. And... Honestly, a part of me felt really stupid. Because I... I, Just like I I said, I I thought, why haven't I done this earlier? Mm -hmm. Why am I scouring the streets of LA looking for black market Suboxone? You know, where do you you think these guys get it from? They get it from doctors, Mm -hmm. right? And he was so understanding, and, and it, you know, of course, there was a there was a part of me that didn't want to go to the doctor because you're thinking, oh, I still want to have a few days where I can get high, you know. I at that point, I really didn't want to get high; I just wanted to get normal. But you're not ready to let it go. It's like it becomes this kind of devil on your shoulder that's your best friend that you're not ready to say goodbye to, and I. I was ready to say goodbye to to that thing. So telling this doctor who was who was great, who was very understanding, I just yeah, it, it took a huge load off. It was the first time I told the full truth to somebody. So yeah. So obviously someone who dealt with rumination and and you know, it, it seems that you know, you're very hard on yourself on why did I do these things and you've told your story now. Are you I are you at a point where you've kind of forgiven yourself that this is like, you, you know, to sort of get past that, I, I, I need to not be so hard on, this is something that impacts a lot of people. Have you gotten to that place where you, you have sort of forgiven yourself for, for this path? Yeah, I, I think I've forgiven myself, but I have moments where suddenly an image will hit me of something I did while I was in it and I'll, I'll just I'm not at the point where I can sit there and kind of let it wash over me and think about it I just try to get it out of my head mm-hmm. and think how the hell did I do that you know um, I, I don't beat myself up so much for I don't know I think I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle um, a, a big part of me just wants to you know cut it off at that point and move forward mm-hmm. right and I think I've been able to do that, but I don't have a, I don't, I really don't have the words for it. I don't know. I don't know yet. Yeah. yeah. It's still early. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's been about a year. I just, I think I don't, it's just the way I am. I just try to, to mm-hmm. move forward and talking about it helps. Right. Right. And, and we talked a little bit before, but going forward, your hope and, and, you look back and say, I wish when I was younger I knew more about this. And, and I mean, is that, is your message sort of going forward for, for, for better awareness and education for people to think about these things and know the, the, the dangers and, and, and how 
this is an epidemic that's facing our, our country. I'm, I, when I was younger, I, I knew that drugs were bad. I just, I think the messaging is a little off because, yeah, I, I knew drugs were bad. I knew I shouldn't do drugs. Absolutely. The problem was once I was doing drugs, you have this feeling that you are the worst part of society, right? So you hide that part from everybody. And if I could have told somebody, I have no way out of this, I don't know what to do. And I, I felt, if I felt like I could have done that earlier, I would have saved myself years. Years of just, and it's absolute torture. You know, it's, there's no other way to describe it. It's total mental torture and eventually physical torture. And so it's not this idea that drugs are bad. I knew that. It's that once you're in it, you can ask for help and you're not going to be judged. Right. Yeah. When you were in, in recovery or far enough along recovery and you wanted to talk about it, uh, you mentioned you I think it was the, for your first experience in talking about your illness and your recovery was when that Toronto Star article that you approached them. Uh, what was your, why did you, you want to do that? Why did you want to go public with your, with your story? For the PR. No, I can't. <laughs> Help your career. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's why I'm here, man. Um, have you checked our views? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's not going to revitalize yeah. your career. Like this. this is also, I can plug my book. Uh, I, I wanted to, you know, I, 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 wa I wanted to talk about it. I wanted to get my story straight. I was writing my story. You know, I, that's what I was doing before I reached out to the Toronto Star. I was, I was writing it. And uh, I, I knew that, just like I said before, if, if I felt like I could have told somebody, and I could have told somebody, I just didn't feel like I could have. But if I felt like I could have, then I, I would have gotten out of it earlier. So I, I think that a story like that, somebody reading that and thinking, okay, I'm going to go to a doctor, if that would help somebody, then that's, that's great. And also a big part of me, I needed to explain myself. You know, there's a, of course, there's a bit of a self, selfish aspect to it. I, I needed to explain that the person that you guys have been seeing for eight years is, is not me. You know, um, and uh, but I, I, I was I was really amazed by the response. You know, everybody was very positive. Nobody said anything bad about it. And I had a few people that were worried about me doing something like that, doing that article. But everybody's response was either support or thank you so much. I'm some a few people said I'm I'm going to get help today, which was amazing. That's good. What like what works for you now? You're made to maintain a healthy. Lifestyle. Podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can stick around. No, <laughs> but uh, what were like? How do you maintain your health? How do you like? Where have you kind of directed some of your energies now in terms of maintaining a healthy lifestyle? I exercise like a madman. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's yeah. I, I I try to exercise every day. I try to you know. There's a there's this part of me that anytime I'm asked to do something social, my first instinct is no. How can I get out of that? So I try to ignore that voice and stay social, stay connected. The first thing that they said to me when I went to rehab was the op the um, what's it called? The opposite of addiction is connection, mm -hmm. which is true. So I try to stay connected. I try to say yes to things. I I, I try to um, see my family as much as I can. And you know, I, I just don't want to. Also, when I first got out of rehab, I went and sat down with my friends one one by one, and I told them. This is what has been happening. So if you see me acting a certain way, I will probably lie to you, but call me on it. Right. right? So I tried to make sure I had a support system of accountability. And, um, and I just I try to stay connected and I exercise. And just don't be, I try not to be so hard on myself. You know, if, if I don't do much in a day, that's okay. Right. When you are doing stuff, what are you, <laughs> what are you doing? You mentioned, uh, I know you went back to school, you were contemplating a career change. Like, what are you, what are you up to now? I am, uh, I'm in a bit of a holding pattern right now. But um, right now I'd say my focus is, is I'm, I'm, I'm getting back to writing with my brothers because you know I, I hadn't done that for so long because I was in a different world. Uh, so doing that and just auditioning and, and looking for, uh, the right part yeah 
And if people want to follow your progress, oh. where can they where can they find you on? Well, my address is uh, <laughs> <laughs> literally oh, yeah. stock. Yeah. If you're on Tinder or Hinge, <laughs> then you can. Um, I'm my Twitter is just at Dylan Casey, mm. and my Instagram. The people that go, what's what's more popular, Instagram you're, or Twitter? You're talking to two old white guys. Yeah, yeah. 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 as a third. <laughs> Dial up internet. So, I'm um, D O K T A D I L. <laughs> Doctor Dill, don't ask yeah, why. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, thank you very much thank for you. being yeah, here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. It's, it's tremendous when people are so honest, and that's what struck me in trying to learn a little bit more about your story was just how honest you were about all the, all the points in your life. Uh, and I think that's what people, because you've gone through it and somebody's going through it right now, and uh, you're helping people. So thank you very much for, for sharing your story. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. This is great. But Let's Talk Day is a, is a great thing. I'm, I'm Talking about it really helps. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.